Okay. So I, I have to tell you all that this has been a very weird time over these last few months. Um, we've stopped going to meetings. Uh, we only meet by Zoom. We have lab meetings by Zoom. It's been kind of weird. But I have to tell you that Liana, Giovanni, Chris, I think this initiative of yours to set up a webinar series on sphingolipids is absolutely excellent. And based on the number of people who sign up, clearly I'm not the only person who thinks like that. I have to tell you, I'm a little intimidated to be the first sphingo leader. And my only conclusion is that what this actually means is sphingo old, i.e. somebody who's actually a bit older than the other people, not sphingo leader. But anyway, thank you very much for making me a sphingo leader. And also thank you to Walt and colleagues in Avanti I actually wanted to wear my Avanti I Love Lipids t-shirt, but my wife didn't allow me. She thought I needed to be a bit more formal. So I can't advertise Avanti, but Liana and, and Chris and Giovanni have done that. So uh, as, let me see what's happening. As Liana mentioned over many years, over unbelievably, over more than 30 years, and by the way, time passes quickly, so, enjoy it while you're young but for for over 30 years i've been working on the site of sphingolipid biosynthesis in my postdoc in dick pagano's lab as some of you knew dick he sadly passed away about 10 years ago i worked on the site of sphingomyelin synthesis in the golgi and for about the last 20 years in my lab i've been working on the site of ceramide synthesis in the endoplasmic reticulum also in my lab, I work on a sphingolipid storage disease, a lysosomal storage disease called uh, Gaucher disease. The enzyme that causes Gaucher disease is shown here, acid beta-glucosidase. And we work on the molecular mechanisms by which the accumulation of this small, simple glycosphingolipid, glucosyl ceramide, affects cellular, particularly nerve cell neuronal function. But um, last year, I had the distinct honor of celebrating my 60th birthday. And I realized that I was getting on a bit. And I realized that the time had come to start thinking about existential things and about the meaning of life and about whether the stuff that I'd done in the last 30 years was actually useful and what I'm likely to do in the next few years. But I have to tell you that it's not just since I was 60 that I've been thinking about these things. But since I was a cute little boy with a tie in London, I spent quite a lot of my time thinking about the meaning of life and what we're all here for. And bearing that in mind, today I'm going to talk about something completely different. Those of you who know Monty Python, uh, English comedy show from the 1960s and 70s, will know that Monty Python completely changed the paradigm of comedy. They came along with a completely different style of comedy, totally unpredictable, absolutely hilarious if you like that kind of thing. But they changed, they were a game changer in terms of comedy. And today I'd like to talk about one of those things, existential things, that I've been thinking about myself over the past uh, uh, months, if not years. And that is a question about whether lipid bilayers are fine tuned. And in order to answer that question, I will need to spend a few minutes defining what fine tuning means, and we'll get a little philosophical there. And then I'll go on and explain to you why I believe lipid bilayers are fine tuned and how that impacts our understanding of lipid bilayers and also our understanding of uh, uh, the origin of life. Now, it's just possible that by the end, I'm gonna talk about low tolerance and high tolerance, it's not impossible that by the end of this talk, you will actually have zero tolerance for me and for what I'm gonna say, but at least bear with me and be polite enough to listen. And I have to tell you the advantage of Zoom is that I don't actually see you. So I can't see the faces that you're making. I can see Liana at the moment. So I don't know if you're upset with what I'm saying or not, but please bear with me for the next 35 or 40 minutes. So the concept of fine tuning comes from cosmology. And fine-tuning is a philosophical debate in which fine-tuning appears. And fine-tuning is often about the universe's fine-tuning for life. And a common definition, this one is taken from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, is the fact that the universe is able to support life 
depends delicately on its fundamental characteristics, notably on the forms of the laws of nature, on the values of some of the constants of nature, and on aspects of the universe's conditions in its very early stages. And those of you who have studied this kind of thing in cosmology will know that the physical constants of the universe are fine-tuned such that the maximal deviation that would support life is in the 10 to the 37, 10 to the 40, 10 to the 55. And if you look at the gravitational constant, it's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And there's a tiny tolerance, a very low tolerance, in how much these physical constants can change to allow life to exist in the universe that we live. So fine tuning is a well-known cosmological uh, 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 issue and, and discussed amongst physicists and cosmologists. So fine tuning is related to another uh, principle, which is called the anthropic principle, first developed by this gentleman here, Brandon Carter. And he said that the universe contains conditions ideal for the development of life. And excuse me for this quote, but he goes on to say, humanity's very existence shows that the structure of the universe and the values of the Whoever that is, could you please turn off your, could you please mute your microphones? Humanity's very existence shows that the structure of the universe and the values of the constants of nature permit life to exist. Many features of the universe necessary for the evolution and persistence of life are the results of unusual coincidences between different values of the constants of nature. If these quantities were slightly altered, then life could not exist in the universe. That's to say, those physical constants, cosmological constants that I mentioned in the last slide, are so fine-tuned to 10 to the minus x that if they differed even a tiny amount, life would not be able to exist in the universe. And this concept was developed by this gentleman called Brandon Carter. A very well-known physicist called Freeman Dyson, who I noticed passed away about two months ago, said the following. As we look out into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy that have worked together to our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe must in some sense have known that we were coming. Now I find that's an amazing quote from a well-known and established physicist. So we have this idea of fine tuning. We have life in the universe on planet Earth as far as we know. We have the physical constants of nature. What does it mean? Philosophically, how do we actually respond to fine tuning? And there have been four suggestions put forward for fine tuning. And each of us, depending on our philosophy, on our ideology, dare I also say our theology, may choose one or other of these four points. First of all, it's a lucky coincidence, which we have to accept as a given. It just so happens that the physical constants in the universe happen to be finely tuned to 10 to the minus x, such that life exists in the universe. And that's a view taken by many people. In fact, I would suggest that most of the scientists that I know would take that view. The other view is that it will be explained by future theories of fundamental physics. Uh, we all know Stephen Hawking suggested that he was able eventually to have a theory of everything. That's to say, eventually physics will be able to somehow explain uh, 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 why there's fine tuning. And by the way, if you want to study a mystical subject, I suggest you study physics and cosmology. The other possibility or another possibility which has been put forward is that fine tuning for life indicates the existence of multiple other universes, multiverses, with conditions very different from those in our universe. That means that our universe is one of a infinite, an infinite number of universes. And we happen by chance to be in the universe where conditions for life as such, that carbon-based life, lipid-based life, which we'll talk about in a minute, happens to exist. And that's again a valid philosophical position, though dare I say that the evidence for the multiverse is limited to put a fine point on it. And the other possibility is a position taken by some people, 
that the universe was created by a designer who established life-friendly conditions. And these are, in my opinion, four valid positions, philosophical positions, which we will discuss again towards the end. So that's fine tuning in physics and cosmology. But biology, of course, is also fine tuned. Though in biology, one of the things I've noticed in years gone by is that biologists tend to be less philosophical than physicists. Physics, people who study physics have much more time for philosophy than biologists. I'm not quite sure if I understand that, that why that is. But biologists have also used the terminology of fine tuning. And this is a paper about the hydrolysis in ATP synthase, where the authors said that ATP synthase is fine tuned. And they go in the text to discuss that simulation, simulations reveal that the active site conformation is fine tuned, and then go on to discuss the distance, the energy surface needed at the one angstrom, 10 to the minus 10 meters uh, uh, level, which allows uh, uh, hydrolysis to occur. And if there's a tiny change in these distances, then ATP synthase would not be able to work. The enzyme, one of the enzymes which I work on, acid beta glucosidase, uh, uh, glucosylidosidase, is also fine tuned. The lipid glucosylidosidase fits beautifully in the active site to allow hydrolysis of the ester bond between glucose and ceramide, so much so that there are hundreds of mutations in this enzyme which cause disease because glucosyl ceramide degradation is no longer possible due to changes in the active site. So many of the molecules that we work on in biology are fine tuned, though perhaps we don't use the terminology. And now we come to the main point of my talk, which is are lipid bilayers fine tuned for life? And if so, what is their tolerance? And what do I mean by that? What is their tolerance for changes? The physical constants and the cosmological constants have unbelievably low tolerance for change. I mentioned 10 to the minus 37, 10 to the minus 50. They cannot change. If they change by a small amount, life would not be possible. Is biology fine-tuned in the same way that uh, 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 physics is fine-tuned? So here we have biology. And I just gave you an example of the ATP synthase which in my opinion is phenomenally high tuned, fine tuned at the level of 10 to the minus 10 meters. How about lipid bilayers? Well, I would suggest that lipid protein interactions are extremely fine tuned. There's extremely low tolerance in how much either the residues which bind the lipids or the lipids themselves can bind. I would suggest that the transmembrane domains which span lipid bilayers are fine tuned with very, very low tolerance. But how about composition? We have asymmetry, we have organella composition, we have lateral mobility, and we have the lipidome. So, how fine tuned are these lipid bilayers? What is the tolerance of change in mole percent composition of a lipid bilayer that would actually affect lipid bilayer function? And that's what I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about before we come to some conclusions. So I'll divide my talks up, my, my, my discussion into lipid composition, into lipid protein interactions, and into something else, but I've forgotten what it is, but we'll come to it in a minute. Okay, so let's talk about lipid composition and fine tuning. So there are way more lipids than we ever imagined. When I began studying sphingolipids in Dick Pagano's lab, we knew of a few hundred, maybe a few thousand lipids. Lipid maps a couple of years ago had identified over 40,000 lipids, of which 4,000 are sphingolipids. And I don't need to tell this distinguished audience that there are many, many long chain bases. Many of you work on the long chain bases. I think there was a webinar on that. There are many n acyl sphingosines or sphingosines or n acyl other long chain bases. There are up to 4,000 known glycosphingolipids. And this is a calculation that comes from the lipid maps in silico uh, webpage. The lipid maps consortium has calculated that there may be up to 1,132,000 1, 
individual structures of lipid in the lipidome. That's a lot more than we used to examine in the old days when all of our lipid analysis was done by TLC. So there is a phenomenal variation in lipid numbers. Uh, I'm just gonna hide some of you people so I don't see you, one minute. Okay, there is a phenomenal variation in, I'll start again, there is a huge compositional variation in lipids. Now, I would like to suggest that cells actually have a low tolerance. So low tolerance, something which cannot be changed without having a biological effect. I would like to suggest that cells have low tolerance, for instance, towards the sphingolipid NA cell chain length. This is a study which some of you may be familiar with, done with my good friend and colleague, Al Merrill, where we made a knockout mouse towards ceramide synthase two. All we did was change the A cell chain composition, and we had a huge effect on the physiology of the mouse and the lipid composition that we generated. So there's a low tolerance towards changes in the sphingolipid A cell chain length. And about two years ago, we published a paper where we looked at the active site, at the uh, residues in ceramide synthase that may determine the A cell chain specificity. And I hasten to add that there's a low tolerance in being able to change the residues in the specificity determining domain of ceramide synthases. So I would like to say that cells have a low tolerance towards changing their A cell chain length. But what about the tolerance towards the number of lipids needed to make a cell? Val O'Donnell published a paper not long ago in which she analyzed the lipidome of platelets and suggested that in the lipidome of platelets, there are about 8,000 lipids, of which about 5,000 were common to two or more donors. She used three individual donors here. And she suggested that a single individual platelet showed 5,000 species. And indeed, people have estimated that a minimally complex single-celled organism requires between 318,000 to 562,000 base pairs of DNA. How many lipids do we need? Indeed, people have suggested, based on pan-genomic analysis, what the pan-genome is and what the individual genome is. And I think it's quite clear from this kind of study that there is significant variability within an individual of the number of lipids that they actually express. But that shouldn't be at all shocking to us because if we look at gene expression in individuals, we also find significant variability in gene expression. So there is a core lipidome and there are changes in individual lipidomes, for instance, in a cell such as the platelet. Now superficially, it may appear that lipid composition has a high tolerance because this kind of issue, that you can actually have individuals with different lipid uh, expression of different lipids, but I would actually say that's not the case. I would actually suggest that we have an extremely low tolerance towards changes in lipid. By way of example, cells go to a huge effort to maintain distinct cellular and organella lipid compositions. For instance, we know that within the ER, ceramide levels have to be maintained at a particular level, or else this causes all sorts of unpleasant things. And our sphingolipid colleague, Joost Holtius, has spent a lot of time attempting to work out how ceramide generated in the ER, if it's generated at slightly too high levels, it needs to be removed from the ER by a number of mechanisms or else the ER becomes overloaded with ceramide. So the ER, for instance, is extremely sensitive and has a very low tolerance to ceramide levels. And uh, our colleague, Herit van Meer, uh, uh, has demonstrated years ago that organella lipid composition varies significantly. If you look at the lipid composition of the ER, the mitochondria, the Golgi, the plasma membrane, endosomes, lysosomes, plotted as a, a, a plot like this, or if you look at the lipids in color between the, the, the Golgi and the plasma membrane, we know that the lipid composition of the ER and the Golgi and the plasma membrane changes significantly, not least with respect to sphingolipids. So I would suggest that actually the lipid composition 
of specific organelles, cellular organelles, has an extremely tight and low tolerance. So what about bilayer complexity, asymmetry, and lateral heterogeneity? This is phenomenal low tolerance. And I love this paper by Ilya Leventel, which just came out not long ago in Nature Chemical Biology. I imagine many of you have seen it. It's a really very interesting paper where Ilya has confirmed a lot of work done in decades gone by, which indicated the plasma membrane was highly asymmetric. And you can see here most of the PC and the sphingomyelin on the outer leaflet, the exoplasmic leaflet, much of the other lipids on the cytoplasmic leaflet. But what Ilya also showed was that most of the unsaturated lipids are on the inner leaflet, and most of the saturated leaflets, lipids on the outer leaflet. And this is another way of demonstrating the uh, uh, asymmetric topology of lipids within the plasma membrane. And I remind you that even a tiny change in lipid asymmetry leads to, for instance, apoptosis. So phosphatidylserine, I don't know if I can see it here, here, phosphatidylserine, most of it is on the inner leaflet. And if we see a tiny change in mole percent of phosphatidylserine, perhaps as low as 1%, this leads to apoptosis. So we have an extreme, excuse me, we have an extremely low tolerance with respect to lipid asymmetry within the plasma membrane. I'll remind those of you who go to meetings that we often have arguments about the asymmetric distribution of sphingomyelin. Because if sphingomyelin is to act as an intracellular signaling molecule, we need some of it on the inner leaflet or on the outer leaflet and to flip very quickly. And there's barely a meeting I go to where somebody doesn't stick up their hand and say, well, 90% of sphingomyelin is in the outer leaflet, blah, blah, blah. How do you explain that? So we care a lot about lipid asymmetry and there is a low tolerance and lipid asymmetry is tightly maintained. A junior postdoc who spent some time in my lab some years ago, uh, uh, Liana Silva and one of her students uh, has done, we've done a lot of biophysics with, with Liana and colleagues. And we know that by biophysical measurements, if you make a relatively large change, so if you change the mole percent of glucosyl ceramide from 10% to 20% in an artificial liposome, you start to see changes in lipid, uh, uh, in, in, in domain formation. Now I should point out that this kind of biophysical study is limited by sensitivity. Here we can see a minimal change in mole percent of about 10%. I don't know if Liana and colleagues have made changes less than 10%. But the question would be, how much compositional tolerance is there for lateral mobility? And if we had the tools to examine lateral mobility at, say, 1% or 0.1%, maybe we would actually see that changes in composition at mole percents as low as perhaps 0.1% may result in domain formation, which would clearly have significant effects on the biophysical properties of lipid bilayers. And actually in my lab, I have a postdoc at the moment who is doing some molecular dynamic simulations, which clearly are much more sensitive than biophysics. Not that I don't love biophysics, but there's a limitation to, to biophysical sensitivity. So I would also suggest that lateral heterogeneity and transbilayer movement, transbilayer asymmetry has an extremely low tolerance. Well, this one is obvious, lipid protein interactions. They have an extremely low tolerance. And this paper published by Felix and Rita some years ago, suggesting that P24 binds a very specific sphingomyelin species, and that this is based on particular residues in the transmembrane domain of P24, caused us in the sphingolipid world to start thinking about the binding of particular sphingolipids to particular transmembrane domains within the plane of the lipid bilayer. And of course, Felix himself and Rita pointed out that changes in any of these residues would stop the specific binding of whatever particular sphingolipid binds to that domain. But there's another study which has just come out, and I go back to Ilya Leventhal's study, 
in which he looked at single pass proteins, proteins which span the membrane one time, and he looked at their surface area in the whole human proteome. He looked at the exoplasmic leaflet, and he looked at the, what's the other one called? The inner leaflet, the inner plasmic leaflet, excuse me, I've forgotten the terminology. And he noticed that the surface area of TMDs, of transmembrane domains, differed between the outer and the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And this works across the whole human proteome. If you now look at organelles within the cell, you can see that the surface area of TMDs differs depending upon the organelle. The plasma membrane has a different distribution of surface area of residues in TMDs than, for instance, the ER. And these TMDs are finely tuned, highly finely tuned, to the lipid composition of that particular organelle. So I would again suggest that TMDs are finely tuned for the lipid composition of the particular organelle in which they find themselves. And just to show you how up to date I am, this paper came out, I think, a couple of days ago, I saw it. Uh, somebody in the DAG, the diacylglycerol world, published a paper in PNS with Andrei Shevchenko, who many of us know, suggesting that subtle chemical differences change these values by orders of magnitude. What he's talking about here is the acyl chain composition, not of a sphingolipid, but of DAG suggesting again that if you change the acyl chain composition or the state of saturation of the diacyl chain, you get changes in orders of magnitude in how DAG binds to molecules such as PKC. Again, finely tuned with low tolerance. So let me conclude. The universe is fine tuned for life. And again, those of you who care about this kind of thing will know that the Big Bang Theory suggests a path by which the universe came into existence with every step being fine-tuned. And I would like to suggest to this distinguished audience that lipid bilayers are no less fine-tuned than the physical parameters of the universe and the cosmological parameters. Um, perhaps they're not fine-tuned to a level of 10 to the minus x, but when I see lipid bilayers in an organelle with the TMDs fine-tuned such that their surface area is totally suited to the lipid composition on one or other side of the lipid bilayer, I start to wonder what those numbers are with respect to fine-tuning. So lipid protein interactions, TMDs, absolutely fine-tuned, asymmetry, organelle composition, lateral mobility, and the liposome, lipid, lipidome, I would also suggest are highly fine-tuned. And I have a few more minutes to go. I was given a bit longer because I'm apparently one of the Sphingo old or one of the Sphingo leaders. So I've given a bit longer to talk and I'm gonna spend another few minutes talking about something which may be even more controversial than what I've been talking about. And that's the following. How does this tolerance slash fine tuning impact upon origin of life models? So if you open a classical textbook, which we all use to either study or we all use to teach, you will see the classical view, such as that presented in the molecular biology of the cell, is that lipids of an appropriate length can spontaneously form lipid bilayers. Thus, a lipid bilayer bubble can contain water and was a likely precursor to the modern cell membrane. And there are two issues when it comes to origin of life models to which I would like to humbly, and I emphasize the word humbly suggest here, that we know absolutely nothing one of them is the origin of life and the abiotic origin of lipids. That's to say the chemical origin, not the biological origin of lipids. How did lipids come into existence? And the other one is complex lipid bilayers. It's all very well 
to have a lipid bilayer bubble, but how do we go from the bubble to this highly fine-tuned, low-tolerance lipid bilayer that we have today in the modern cell? Do we actually have any biochemical evolutionary pathways which can explain how this happened? And again, I would suggest that we have nothing if not less than nothing. So one of my colleagues in the Weizmann Institute, uh, Professor Doran Lancet, who I've also known for um, close to 40 years actually, doesn't believe in the RNA model, doesn't believe in the metabolism first model. He believes in a model called the lipid world model. This is a high tolerance model and it has to be. And the lipid world model for life's emergence involves primordial assemblies of lipid-like amphiphilic molecules and they do computer simulations in which they allow the computer to make whatever amphiphile you want. And these amphiphiles gather together in one of these bubble-like molecules that the molecular biology of the cell talks about. However, there are conditions which have to happen to allow the lipid world model for work. And Professor Lancet Doron himself says, in order for the lipid world hypothesis to be tenable, Lipid-like amphiphils, which are capable of forming liposomes or vesicles, need to be present in the environment. Okay, I buy that. Specifically, these fatty acid chains need to be at least 10 to 12 carbons long and present in concentrations above the CMC. So in order for the first protocell bubble, whatever you want to call it, to come into existence, you need at least 10 to 12 carbon atoms, and you need these atoms, these carbons, these amphiphiles, to be present at at least the CMC. And they need to be able to duplicate, to replicate, but Doron has a model for how they uh, replicate. He has no model for how they were first found. So much so that he suggests that the models could be found in the prebiotic synthesis on Earth, on carbonaceous meteorites, having been formed in interstellar reactions or by catalysis from precursors. Now, does the chemistry of work? I would suggest it doesn't. And I'm not the only one to suggest this. And I, I left this up, not so that you spend your time going through it now, but if anyone wants to look at the, uh, the, you know, this talk after I finished, does the chemistry work? So this gentleman, Tomonori Totani from Japan, who I don't know, suggests that the chemistry could work, but it can only work in what is known as an inflationary universe. And let me explain what he says here. So at the moment, in order to form a self-replicating RNA molecule, you need about 40 to 100 nucleotides. Dr. Totani has calculated how many sun-like stars with their Earth-like planets able to sustain life, you would need in able to form a nucleotide of between, uh, sorry, an RNA molecule of between 10, 40 to 100 nucleotides. And he comes to the conclusion that there are not enough sun-like stars in the Milky Way, which is about 10 to the 11, or sun-like stars in the visible universe, which is about 10 to the 22, to allow this to happen. So life in the visible universe cannot emerge spontaneously, at least according to the RNA model. And what Dr. Totani suggests is that you need an inflationary universe. So at some stage after the Big Bang, physicists and cosmologists suggest that there was a rapid expansion of the universe called the inflationary period. And that's actually given rise to 10 to the 100 stars. Many of these are not visible. We don't see them. But Dr. Totani has suggested that you need 10 to the 100 stars to have enough Earth-like planets in order to allow life to exist, to emerge, and thus in the inflationary universe, there's a better statistical probability of an RNA polymer emerging. And let's apply the same arguments to lipids. There is a vanishingly small chance of lipids emerging. So there's an extremely low tolerance in terms of the origin of life with respect to lipids. So lipids emerging spontaneously, either in hot thermodynamic areas or wherever, the chance of it happening is vanishingly small in my opinion, 
certainly in the known universe, uh, uh, and we need to deal with that. What about the emergence of modern <coughs> lipid binaries? So Dr. Shozak, Shostak, a Nobel laureate, has suggested the following model, and this is typical of models for the origin of life. What Dr. Shostak has suggested is that the original lipid layers, the original, cell, the original cells contained lipids with a mono acyl chain that were semi-permeable to the solutes needed to allow small solutes to go into the cell where the chemical reactions of life occurs. He has an experiment, this was published in PNAS, where he shows indeed that monoacyl chain lipids are more permeable than diacyl chain lipids. So Dr. Shostak then suggests that along came diacyl chain lipids, somehow inserted themselves in these monoacyl lipid bilayers, and that stopped the permeability of small molecules uh, inside cells, and therefore one needed to evolve transporters within the plasma membrane, which allowed these small solutes to, to emerge. I hasten to add again that Dr. Shostak suggests that in order to generate these acyl, these diacyl chain lipids, one needs to postulate the existence or the evolution, the generation of an acyl transferase ribosome. That's to say an RNA molecule with catalytic activity to allow the formation of diacyl lipids. And again, we can all do the statistics in our head and calculate the statistical likelihood of this happening. So where are we? We know a lot about the genetic basis of evolution. Uh, people have spent an awful lot of time working out how genes may or may not change over uh, 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 billions of years or millions of years. But we can also apply some of the principles of genetic principles of evolution to abiogenesis and molecular evolution. For instance, how do we go from simple bilayers made perhaps of amphiphiles of more than 10 carbon units to complex lipid bilayers? And I would like to emphasize that molecular evolution proceeds according to uh, 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 Darwin by two key principles. One of them is that it occurs by small gradual changes. And the other one is that it's in undirected. Evolution by definition is purposeless and unguided, and there is no place for teleology. Teleology means purpose. Evolution is undirected. There is no purpose. And what molecular evolution, using these two principles, needs to be able to do is the following. It needs to be able to explain the generation of complex lipid bilayers and simple amplifiers. And I'm sorry, but the kind of hypothesis by Dr. Shostak and others simply don't work. It needs to explain how a protocell develops with selective diffusion. It need to, needs to explain lipid asymmetry, lipid rafts, lipid protein interactions, membrane proteins and lipid binding domains. And I think that we should be honest enough and perhaps even humble enough to admit that we are nowhere near being able to explain any of these. And perhaps worse than that, perhaps the models may even not work. And I have another three or four minutes and then you can all shout at me. In my particular work, we have the ceramide synthases and we have a chicken and egg dilemma because we have acyl chain composition and we have ceramide synthases. And we need a particular acyl chain composition and we need a particular ceramide synthase to explain how that acyl chain composition came into to being. It's a kind of cyclic event. What came first, the chicken or the egg? And I thought about this a lot and I have no good solutions. So this is where I'm gonna go slightly um, um, wild. What are the philosophical thoughts that come up as we think about the fine tuning of lipid bilayers? Here is Rodin's The Thinker. And, and I'd just like to point out that many of us listening to this webinar have a PhD. A PhD is a doctor of philosophy. And I would also like to suggest that perhaps in science, we need to be a little more philosophical, not just thinking of our data, but what does our data mean? Aristotle, one of the early philosophers, 
uh, two and a half thousand, two thousand four hundred years ago, looked at nature and came up with certain a certain viewpoint. Uh, he uh, came up with the term of teleology, suggesting that there's purpose in nature. I'm not suggesting that at the moment, but I am suggesting that we need to be a bit more philosophical in the science that we do. So if I go back to the four points that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, discussing fine tuning of the universe, how can we, be, how can we apply some of these philosophical concepts to the fine tuning of lipid bilayers? We could say that lipid fi bilayer fine tuning is a lucky coincidence which we have to accept as a given. It's luck. I had a conversation with somebody a couple of years ago, a Nobel laureate in physics, who when I suggested to him or somebody else suggested to him a statistical chance of 10 to the 279, said, well, we're here, so it must have happened. It's a valid position, but we all need to examine whether we can take that kind of statistical possibility. Lipid bilayer fine tuning and complexity will be explained in the future by theories of fundamental biology or physics. Just like Hawkins suggests that a theory of everything will explain physics in the future, maybe there'll be a theory of biology or biochemistry which explains everything in the future, maybe. Fine tuning indicates the existence of multiverses with conditions very different from our own universe where lipids or lipid bilayers may or may not be important. According to the multiverse idea, there are multiverses, other universes out there, where life may not be based on sphingolipids. Personally, as a sphingolipid biologist, I find it difficult to imagine life which is not based on sphingolipids, but apparently there may be a multiverse out there where sphingolipids are not important. Let me again point out that the evidence of multiverses is nil, and there are philosophical discussions in the literature about whether the multiverse should even be considered within the realm of science. And then there's a fourth idea, which is that lipids were fine-tuned by a designer to make life possible. And I would like to say that I, my personal philosophical position identifies very clearly with one of these four positions. I would like to finally suggest that it's time for a Kuhnian revolution in our understanding of lipid bilayers. You see, I've been having a lot of fun in the last few years thinking about philosophy. Kuhn basically said that most of our life we do normal science. We do science with a, within a certain framework. We believe there are lipid bilayers, okay? Uh, uh, Newton, Einstein, Darwin, they were all game changers. They came along and said the model of normal science doesn't work. And along came a revolution and a paradigm change. Is it time for a Kuhnian revolution in our understanding of lipid bilayers? Or let me be more modest. Is it time for a semi-Kuhnian revolution? I'm not convinced that any of us is Newton or Einstein or Darwin or, or Galileo, but maybe we can make a small change in the paradigm of how we understand lipid fine, the, based on what we understand of the fine tuning of lipid bilayers. I don't need to tell you that in the late 1890s, early 1900s, cell boundaries were discovered to be oil-like. A few years later, they were discovered to be a bilayer. 1970s, I think, was a game changer. I don't know if it was a Kuhnian. I don't know if, if, if Thomas Kuhn would agree this was a Kuhnian change, but it was a major change. And I would like to now suggest that it's time that we considered lipid bilayers as fine-tuned molecular machines which have an extremely low tolerance towards change. And to end, I would like to invite you all next year in October, we had to push this back by a year, to a meeting which we're going to have called the First International Conference on the Deep Anatomy of Nature, Power and Limits of Unguided Physical Processes, and I hope that the title speaks for itself. And finally, I'd like to end with a very nice lipid bilayer. Uh, for those of you who don't know, those are members of my lab who may disown me after I've given this talk, as may some of you, but nevertheless, I thank you for listening for a bit longer than I thought. And I'd be happy if you want to ask me questions or shout at me or whatever. Thank you very much. <laughs>